Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Ask Alumni Live Career Conversation, part of the Alumni Career Compass Program at the University of Melbourne. The Career Compass Program aims to demonstrate some of the benefits of the university's alumni community by giving recent graduates access to alumni who will share insights and advice based on their career journey. My name is Carl Brown. I'm an Alumni Relations Officer here at the University of Melbourne. It's my pleasure to be joined online this evening by alumnus Mon Chu. Thanks for joining us, Mon. Pleasure to be here, Carl. Mond is a designer, narrative animator, and um, digital craftsman, and he's the founder of United Make, an experimental think tank and multidisciplinary studio based here in Melbourne. He works in research, practice, and teaching in Australia and internationally, and challenges designers to innovate. He's a graduate of the University of Melbourne Bachelor of Architecture and the Master of Entrepreneurship, and has worked as an architect, digital prototyping lab assistant, film editor, and consultant. He's also created his own digital island in Google Maps, and we'll be sure to come back to that at some point too, I think, because that's pretty fascinating. Thanks for joining us. To start off with, Mond, could you give us a brief description of your career journey and how you got to your current role? Absolutely, Carl. So I think it's just like any Australian. I went to high school, went to university at Melbourne University, went there for three years at Melbourne University, then did my stint overseas, did a lot of work for different practices, sort of different things. And I think as a millennial would, had a lot of interests, had a lot of different things that I wanted to do. And the only way I could do them was to start my own business. So packed my bags from London, came back on the plane, thought about a name, was reading Makers at the time, the book. And somehow I came up with the original name, United Make, registered the next day I got back. And that was in 2013 and haven't looked back since. So I think in terms of jobs, I haven't had a lot of jobs. I've got jobs in consulting and furniture, as well as animation, as well as education. But I think a lot of the change in roles of jobs has happened within United Make from when we started to where we are now. And I think we're still evolving. That's fantastic. And what took you to London, first of all? Yeah, so I think as you grow up in Australia, you're quite isolated from the rest of the world. It's basically an island and you're quite close to your suburbs and friends, but there's so much more in the world that you see. I think, you know, we grew up with the internet and there's a lot of images that you see on the other side of the world and you're always fascinated. And when I was 17, I think I had enough of Melbourne and to really explore my myself more, I traveled all around the world. So I went to London and from London, I've been to Chernobyl in Ukraine. I've been to Baikonur in Kazakhstan. I went to Barrow in Alaska. I remember in Barrow, we went in winter solstice. So it was negative 40 degrees plus wind chill. That was quite a fascinating experience because of all these collective experiences. I think it's made me a better designer and uh, definitely recommend anyone who is a bit stuck in a rut or thinking about changing careers to to go and travel (laughs) and can you maybe elaborate on on how working internationally or traveling as well has has actually influenced the the way that your career itself has developed sure so when you're in your own bubble let's say in Melbourne, you don't know what the differences are in the world. You don't know what you're doing is any different from anyone else. But when you start rubbing those things that you're doing against other cultures and other climates and other vernaculars, you start picking out different types of design or elements or nuances that you probably wouldn't get. So when you're wandering around, you're more aware of your surroundings. You don't go into default. Uh, You start picking up smaller things and it really, I guess, shocks your brain. I think there's more neurons connecting just to put these patterns together and making sense of the world. Similar to when you were a kid, probably when you saw everything for the first time, you're a lot more attentive. And for me personally, when I was traveling, I always like to travel to different places. You become a lot more attentive, even though it's tiring. Sometimes I need a holiday after traveling because it's a lot more, how can I put it? Uh energy absorbing than just the daily grind of work. And can you maybe give us a sense of what your day-to-day work actually looks like, just to give those who are listening a bit of a a context? What does a day in the life of Mon actually look like? It varies quite a lot. I spent about eight months in Melbourne and four months overseas. Four months overseas being at projects in Shanghai, teaching in the UK, lecturing in Europe per, per, per se. But generally a day, I have a pretty regimented time that I like to wake up. So I have an alarm that's set at 6.55, which gives me five minutes to get out of bed after the alarm. (laughs) Uh, Once that happens, I somehow sort of stay in bed to meditate a little bit just to get my 
thoughts clear. Uh, shower, Wheaties and uh, an apple uh, with a bit, a bit of honey. Then I start work. I always get into the office about an hour earlier than all, all the other staff members just so that I can plan out my day know what my priorities are so what i must do what i should do and what i could do and once the whole team comes along i have a team meeting we, we go through all the challenges that we're facing also the things that we need help with and then we power through so i usually do all my thinking work during the start of the day just because it my, my brain is the most active and then in the afternoon i start doing a lot of my sort of social email checking uh, all that in my socials and then at night i usually do my grinding work so uh, things that i've already planned out but i just need to get get it done uh, sure. And generally, that's uh, a rough, you know, rough guide to the day. But obviously, a lot of the people who are listening are in the early stages of their career, either recent graduates or, or early career. Um, what would be the advice that you would give to someone in that situation who's looking to try and make the best of that early stage? What things have you learned in your career so far that you would really advise other people to take on board? I would definitely question why they're doing the course they're doing. I think that they should always have a leg outside of academia within academia as well. So for example, the reason why I'm doing this degree is because I want to get to this point or I'm really fascinated about this area and I want to become an expert and that's why I'm doing this university. Don't become... I guess, in the bubble of university and get caught up with just grades because in the end of the day, they don't matter. You come out of it and you have to fend for yourself anyway. And I think the ones that succeed are the ones that know exactly why they're at uni and how they're going to come out of it and what they're looking for, be at the networks, be at the people they met. But I think the main thing is that the people that just focus on university without having an idea of the real world get lost once they finish university because it just starts again. And they're basically saying, oh, what, what do I do now? <laughs> Where do I find a job? And what job do I find? So I think having a clear intent. I know that's hard being a young person and you don't know. So one of the things that I do suggest is get a job <laughs> whilst at uni. Figure out what you like and what you don't like. And, you know, drag out your university degree. It doesn't mean you have to get, you know, it's not a race to get it finished. It's more about figuring out yourself and also experimenting. And if you're young, I would say take some risks. You know, you don't have any dependence on you. You don't, you know, have that much to lose. No, don't put all your money on a casino gambling thing. But, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I would risk on things <laughs> on definitely uh, things that you do believe in, uh, things that have impact in the world and has value to other people. I guess that's the clearest advice or vaguest advice I can give. <laughs> yeah. I know I think there, there's definitely something in there about kind of using the experience that you're going through whether it is if you're still at university or whether you're in the very early stages and kind of trying one company and maybe moving to a different one and seeing how the two compare and contrast it there's a lot to be said for not just being there doing the work and then that's it like really think about what you're getting out of that experience so yeah that's great advice on the similar sort of vein could you talk us through maybe some of the challenges that you've overcome in your career and how you would advise recent graduates maybe to avoid or manage the similar sort of challenges? Yeah, that's one of the challenges I had. I was stuck in university and I thought after university, I would have a lot of jobs, have a lot of, you know, design the latest museums, latest airports after architecture and coming out the realization that that's not going to happen I sort of fell quite quickly and fell into yeah. place quite fast. But also I realized that the stuff that I was doing within the changing world it was meaningful for me to actually pick up on the technology part, pick up on the skills that I learned from London and Melbourne and really express that in a way that no one else had at, the, at that point. And for me is really the challenges of trusting yourself enough, really giving it a good shot. I think I was quite hesitant in the beginning because you, know, you are starting out and it is hard, but also surrounding yourself with good people. In my first couple of years, I didn't have a mentor at all. So I was running blind. I would always say that have a mentor, have a place that you want to go. Even, you know, the greatest people in the world have mentors, you know, even presidents, even, you know, great athletes, they always have coaches and mentors to help them along the way. So those are the things that I would definitely suggest and those challenges that I had because it's quite lonely at the beginning. I also think that get a good accountant. It's also good advice. If you want to start your own thing, get your book sorted. That's also really good to know. As a you know, naive designer, I always, you know, design first, money second, right? It's always design first, which, you know, I, I think I had a good intuition with money at the beginning, but eventually it just comes down to the point that if you don't value yourself, no one else does. 
So start valuing what you are and what you're worth. And then, you know, things will start to happen. Sure. And you obviously had a bit of experience from working in different countries before you came and started your company here. How did they come about? Like, was it through people that you had met along the way? Was it just through serendipity that you happened to stumble across them? How did that happen? So that happened by literally just being curious and making friends with people that were doing interesting work. And, you know, as digital Washington would say, like, you know, if you stay in the barbers long enough, you're going to get a haircut, right? So (laughs) I was around the AA, I was around this design scene for a long time. And I had similar, you know, I was figuring out what my interests were because there was so much variety. And I dabbled in a lot of things. And I realized what my strengths were after a while. You know, when I start comparing myself with others and started to be in a world of crazy ideas, you start getting to know yourself a lot more. And from that, people start recognizing that. And then you start collaborating. And then also uh, people recommend when you start having a stronger voice. Fantastic. And so you've kind of alluded to the idea of the fact that your friends became kind of a network that you you relied on. Um, I think one of the things that we often talk about when we're discussing careers and career advancement is this amorphous thing that is networking. And people tend to hear the word and automatically kind of shudder thinking, oh, yeah. I've got to stand in a room with people and make yeah. a polite conversation and it's really awkward. But I think one of the things that you're kind of pointing out here is the fact that you can network in a whole range of different ways through people that you're actually very comfortable with as well. Can you maybe talk us through a bit about how you've developed a network and how you've leveraged that along the way? Absolutely. Networking is such a tainted word these days. It's used so much in the corporate world and, you know, conferences that, you know, people actually lose themselves a bit. They're just looking for the outcome. They're looking just to get that job or looking to you know, get that pay or looking to get that contract. It's more about connecting with people, I find. You know, finding people that have similar values with you or you know, challenges you in a way. But actually just genuine human connection, I think is something that people should be doing. And the friends that I've made in Melbourne as well as in the AA are the ones that actually have supported me through a lot of the stuff that I've done. And I am where I am today is also because I've been supported from them and the opportunities that they've given me. So in a way, I've been standing on the shoulders of giants, right? So for me, I would say less networking, more connection, right? It's like genuine connection. It's hard to do these days with all the social media influences and also this, you know, instant gratification that you get from just, you know, trying to get the latest or the most, you know, authentic, you know, experiences around the world. But I think if you really start slowing down a bit, uh, really, you know, writing down what you value. And, you know, I've also found out that over the progression of you know six seven years you also have to unlearn things i know that's a counterintuitive thing to say but you have to unlearn things that you thought was right at that point but now you're in a different stage of your life that you have to unlearn Mm -hmm. so you can really focus on what you need to be at and where you need to go so i think in terms of networking for me at the beginning was you know it's vital for business Uh, but then i unlearned that you know it's it's not just about the network it's about the connections that you're making and those are the things that i would definitely seek you know anyone to do and it's okay not to like people, you know? It's, it's okay to, you know, not have the same opinion. I think too many people today just want to be liked, you know? They want to agree with everything and be tolerant because they want to be liked. But if you do believe in something, you can do it in a very productive way, of course, not, not in a very negative manner. But, you know, stand up for what you believe in, stand up for what is you think is right, and have that conversation. And you mentioned kind of standing on the back of giants, which is a fantastic phrase. Can you maybe give us an insight into some of the, the best pieces of advice that those giants have actually given you over the time? What, what would be a standout oh. piece of advice that you've been recipient of? Start your own business, do your own thing, do it your way, do what is right, not what is easy. Figure out what you want to say and say it with pride. I can name these quotes like like <laughs> like everything. Sounds um, like you practice these. <laughs> if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. Yep. <laughs> that's um that's a good one. But also I, I think the, the biggest one for me is just you know, just be genuine, you know, like like you know there's too many life is too short to you know try and live up with other people being being yourself and what you believe in because you know we're in an age that you should respond to isn't the same as your parents age or the same as you know the the age that your your kids are going to live in so say what is right now and uh, hopefully you know it impacts a lifetime a quote from frank gary would be you know design within the time that you are but yearn for timelessness i think that's a that's a really beautiful quote and especially in the the processes that i think about when i start designing something so yeah, 
And with looking at how you have kind of set up your own business, that, that was something that you decided because it, it kind of gave you the freedom to, to practice in the way that you want to practice and so forth. Can you, can you tell us what that looked like in the very early stages? I mean, for someone who has never set up a business before, that would seem like an almost impossible prospect. What steps did you really have to go through? Because you make it sound very easy. Look, I was very naive back then and I just took it straight on. I took it straight on. I was smart enough to take a side job at teaching as well. So that sort of paid for a lot of stuff. So even if the businesses were bad, I could counteract those situations by teaching. But, you know, there was jobs that I just basically hustled to get. I remember the first, one of the first kiosk jobs I did was for Adriano Zumbo. And I had no idea who he was when I was in London. One of my roommates, she loved Australian MasterChef. And when I went back to Australia, she was like, Mond, Adriana was looking for a designer for a new kiosk in Melbourne. You should check, check it out. I, I told her that I had no idea who he was or I've never done designer kiosk before because I've made a fictional island on Google. She's like, just give it a shot. So I sent in, you know, expression of interest. He responded. I think from my animation background, they wanted a mood board. And I submitted uh, an animation as a mood board, which was very different from everyone else. So he was intrigued and selected us. And once we got the job, I had no idea what I was doing. So I was completely out of my depth. But as a good designer, I knew that I needed to understand the situation. So I asked Adriano if I could go work for him in his kiosk in Sydney. So I actually went there for a day and two and learned all the different types of things that was going on inside the kiosk. So I could take all those learnings into the kiosk that I brought into Melbourne. And those are the things that, you know, as a young, you know, career to starter to really understand, I think learning from first principles is probably one of the best things that I could suggest. Don't take everyone's word as gospel. Do it yourself because you might find out there's different ways of going about it that works for you and it might not work for anyone else. But as I said, get a good accountant, get your books right. But besides that, I think uh, the key way is to really just, you know, learn from your mistakes and move forwards. I wouldn't say failure is, you know, the, the the best thing, I just call it a prototype. You know, it hasn't worked yet. It will. So it's not a failure. It's a prototype. And I've got many of them in my studio. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're on the shelf and uh, they might come out someday. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Um, we've got a question that's just come through from one of our listeners, Julian, who's going back to one of your earlier points. Do you have any tips or tricks for unlearning ingrained habits? So when you say kind of unlearning things that you need to at different points in your life. How have you how have you pushed yourself to do that? Well, I think you have to be really diligent. Maybe, you know, six months in your life, six months in your life, you just sit down with a notebook and yourself and write down a priority list of things like, what am I really prioritizing right now? What am I focusing on? Because you can easily walk through life without having any goals or aims. You know, I think after university, it hits really quickly that there's no exam. <laughs> you don't need to wake up. You know, you don't need to go to class. No one's going to come after you. So what's your goals? Where, where are your aims? What do you want to do? And I think you need to give yourself accountability. And those are the things which start to realize that, oh, I don't really need to know this anymore. I understand this. I think evolved from this train of thought to this train of thought. So first thing is first is to write down the things where you want to go and write down where you're at. And then you'll start to learn and unlearn things as you progress. So six months is a good time. If you're doing really tight deadlines and really tight things, I think a month, you know, you don't have to do it every day. Like, you know, you got, but, you know, do what works for you. I just found like every six months, I get a check in in life. I'm like, is this where I want to go? Is this where the business is going? Is this what I, I see myself doing? Or am I just going down a rabbit hole, you know, and just chugging through life, having no idea? <laughs> Very good advice. And I guess that applies both in business and personal. Like you need to be reflective on yourself at various points. Absolutely. Going back to, to your, your own business, I think one of the, the motivators for you coming back to the university and studying Master of Entrepreneurship at the, the Wade Institute was to continue to grow your business and to, to help that flourish. What were your other motivating factors and what did you get out of that experience when you came back? One of the things that I really wanted to do when I got back to Melbourne was reconnect with people. Mm -hmm. And uh, starting a business at that point, I had a lot of architecture friends, but I didn't have many friends that was outside of architecture. And the way that started was I went to the Future Assembly conference during that time and the Wade Institute was presenting and I applied for a scholarship and luckily I got that and I thought it was a great transition into the business world with different like-minded people. 
And that was very positive on my end. I would recommend it for people who know what they want to get out of it rather than people who have no idea. It's always better to have an aim because you'll get more out of it. So those are the things that I would definitely recommend people who want to do something in terms of entrepreneurial activity or having the, I guess, connections and people to have the similar conversations. Sure, absolutely, fantastic. Just kind of bringing the conversation around to, obviously a, a percentage of our um, graduates are people who have moved to Australia for study from elsewhere in the world. Do you have any advice to give to those who are starting out in their career journey, hoping to, to remain in this country? Obviously not kind of visa advice, but um, are there things that you would would advise people who don't have that kind of natural connection to this country from having been brought up here, what would be your advice in starting out in, in the architectural development area? I would say leveraging your own background and definitely finding where you stand and what you are good at, especially from where you come from and what your values are from then. So using your strengths to compete with other people within this country rather than trying to fit the mold. I think the ones that you know do last are the ones that do have personality, <laughs> are the ones that do have their own voice, uh, the ones that do have their own opinions rather than just following the, following the grain. Absolutely. And maybe tied to that, can you give us a sense of the sorts of things, the sort of traits that you look for in the people that you hire or look to work with in your company? What, what should people consider when trying to make themselves as marketable as possible in the workplace? It really depends on uh, the industry that you're looking for. But for me personally, I definitely look for authenticity, the ability to problem solve on their feet, the ability to take pressure really well and also work well with others. I think, you know, you could be a rock star yourself, but if you don't work with others, you know, you're not going to go very far. So those are some of the traits that I definitely look into and also willing to take advice and learn and keep learning and unlearning. Absolutely. I think we're going to come back to that unlearning, are we? One of the things that um, I also wanted to ask was how do you actually kind of stay up to date in your profession? What do you do to, I guess, maintain a relevance and a sense of what's going on in the industry? Traveling. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely traveling is a big part of it. I think the internet has definitely helped in many ways growing up with it, but also being able to filter out through fake news, but also believing different types of mythologies and you know, legends online. A lot of you know, time for reading uh, books that you know, like you know, Bill Gates takes a week off just to read and isolate himself. I, I like to travel and I also just you know, doodle and sketch a lot, just letting my mind wander uh, a bit. So those are the things that I sort of keep myself accountable for sometimes. And if I'm slipping too much, it's probably one of the reasons why I'm not being on top of everything. But yeah, just giving myself that space. Sure. And um, one of our other registrant questions that came through um, in the lead up to this session was, what's been the most difficult part of your career? What has been the, the biggest challenge that you've had to face? Biggest challenges that I faced in my career is one, people leaving in the company and just you by yourself, quite lonely, basically holding up the whole company and the notion that wouldn't it just be easier just to quit and get a nine to five job? You've got bills to pay, you know, you've got the daily grind of life. Definitely has put a lot of questions in my mind, but those challenges sort of came up and uh, you just sort of uh, write, write it all down, write down the priority list, write down the learnings that you have and how to progress and see how it goes. And the second ones I think is, you know, how to deal with failure, especially uh, when you don't get jobs, you don't win competitions, uh, you get kicked back, uh, things that are out of your control sometimes, things that, you know, you might, you know, you can always question yourself in hindsight, did I not work hard enough, did I not work, do a lot enough. And those challenges is a, is a sort of mental strength that you sort of have to build up over the years and having that grit to really push through. It's, it's not the easiest thing, to say the least, but in the end of the day, it's the most rewarding that when you go through that journey. And you've obviously, you've worked in architecture, but you've also kind of branched out into to other creative forms as well through branding and all sorts of different bits and pieces there. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk us through how that's worked for you and how others might kind of take their particular skills and apply them in, in ways that maybe their, their studies or their experience to date hasn't given them chance to touch on yet? Mm. So for me, when I was doing architecture at university, buildings were just one medium that the idea could take. 
And as you know, not all problems can be solved by building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how we started approaching it was more strategy. So thinking behind, well, what were the solutions? Some of it were more installation based, some of it more branding based, some of it were more furniture based. So the mediums that the output of the project could take is completely diverse, digital or physical or fidgetal, as we like to call it now, a bit of a mix of the both. And I think once you start questioning, just as I talked about about first principles, about, well, what are you really trying to do? Are you trying to connect with people? Are you trying to get more bums on seats? You know, what are the sort of KPIs or key, key performative your indicators that you're looking for? Then you can really dig deep into the problem and come up with a whole array of solutions. And those solutions from the key problem is constantly evolving as technology is evolving, culture is evolving the answers should always be evolving. So that's why I think we're always trying to keep on top of it. And I know architecture seems like it's just building sometimes, but it's a lot more than that. When we were studying it, I did a completely fictional island when I studied architecture. So it's all about this digital world that we're currently living in and how that's impacting our physical lives. Absolutely. I might encourage our, our guests online to actually have a think about the some of the questions that they might want to ask if there are any that are coming out of the conversation we've had. Sure. But whilst they're doing that, I might just get you to actually give us a bit more of a sense of how did a digital island come about and how did that actually become such a big deal? Like it, it was reported in so many different places. Tell us a little bit about that. So this was around 2012, 2013 when Google MapMaker started opening its doors to everyone so that they could get third party people to add to its maps so you can you know, get more information for everyone. And this was a time where everyone was using Google Maps to travel everywhere. Everyone would start recognizing places with images. And I thought it would just be funny if I would start tagging images from London in Mexico, Mexico in London. And once that started getting accepted, I went deeper into the rabbit hole. So as an architect, you're sort of really good at image making, right? You do amazing lifelike realistic renders. So I started Photoshopping images rather than having genuine images. And I pushed it to a point where I worked out the algorithm of how Google and Panoramio were selecting images. And I could put on any form of digital manipulated images online. And then there was this island in Mexico that wasn't named yet in Google. So I wrote to Google and, and said, this island is called Adat Nolta, which in Spanish is Atlantis backwards. And after two weeks, they wrote back to me saying, thank you for your contribution. We'll be adding it in the next two weeks. Wow. And that just sort of went into a deeper rabbit hole where I started creating a Wikipedia page, built a stage set model where it was live streaming from a room in London onto a Mexican island online. And this project got so far that a National Geographic photographer contacted me and wanted to visit this place. <laughs> so it, we live in interesting times where the digital world affects us so much physically and it only just got more and more prevalent over the last six years. Like the whole situation with fake news, the whole situation with the most voted TripAdvisor restaurant was actually fake. All these things are now emerging. And uh, for us, we always want to be on top of that digital and physical world. So we're very fascinated within virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality. So in a nutshell, I was just curious. I experimented and that experiment led me to different you know, ideas and places. And do you see the the kind of intersection between technology and, and the built environment? Do you see that actually playing out in different ways in the future? I mean, obviously, we can already create in the digital environment in 3D and um, design that way. Architects have been doing that for, for years. But do you see that there's a, there's a natural evolution going beyond that in any particular direction? Yeah, I, I think the two worlds are starting to merge a lot more. So in Initially, it was a lot more isolated. It was through the screen, and it is still the screen majority-wise, but it's going to start to blur and bleed. You're not going to start realizing what is digital and physical anymore in the future once AR and things start taking off, because we already put our trust in so many of these digital systems that I think it's not quite a big leap just to say that these things in terms of information will start exploding uh, into three-dimensional realms, so spatial computing rather than just a flat screen. Tying into that, do you think that there's 
a chance that technology will actually take over even more of the architectural design process. Do you feel that there's a there's an AI future here where where the actual individual is less responsible for it? Definitely. So I, I believe there's going to be all types of different architects, from the ones that design skyscrapers to the ones that design residential houses. And AI is a great tool that we should not be scared of because it's basically an input device that would start working out different ways of combinations that your computing power, your hard drive and your CPU can't comprehend as quick and it will give you different answers and solutions where you ultimately can pick from and refine. So it's more of a collaborative way of designing, which I am fully encouraging rather than watch out robots are taking your job because (laughs) I believe that I'd rather the robot help me with my job rather than me going to hammer every single nail <laughs> yeah. and, and doing every single form. And I uh, guess inevitably there's there's always going to be an element of design that certainly the computers as we consider them right now could not kind of replace because yes, you can build a building based on past constructs and all the rest of it, but you to actually come up with an associated design based on what a client wants and the, the client's very nuanced needs, uh, that's presumably never going to be something that a computer can get its ear around. I, I don't know. We probably could. You know, like in terms of the different factors that it could calculate, it might be even better at calculating the subtleties in the human, you know, and what they want rather than getting, you know, confused by emotion or too uh, clouded by your own ego, right? So those things might actually help the designer. And I think our role is asking the right questions first, making sure that the inputs are right, because you know, you know what, what goes in badly comes out badly. And thirdly is the creative side. So is this actually meaningful? Is this actually helping? And what is it doing? So I am all for it. It doesn't keep me up at night, nonetheless. But if it did, you know, I think the human race would constantly innovate as well. Or maybe, as I said, blurring between the two, maybe we'll just have neural links that would blur between the two. <laughs> well, I think that's that's kind of reassuring for, for people who might be in their early stages of their career worrying, is it too late? Is my job already fated to be kind of taken over by technology? It sounds like there's, there's hope for quite some time there already. So Yeah, I think you should use it. Absolutely. Before we wrap up, I wonder if you can maybe tantalize us with some information about some of your your current or very recent projects that you've been involved with and the sort of breadth of the work that you and your colleagues actually do at the company. Yeah, so we recently just came back from Strawberry Fields. So we're doing an installation for them next year, sort of an interactive one. We're also currently designing a food dining experience, translating one of our clients' poems into a food experience. We're also curating the future prototyping exhibition at Melbourne University with NGV Design Week, which will be quite fun. So if you guys are around in March, I definitely invite you to come. It's all free. We're currently also doing two architectural projects. One is to design roof gardens in suburbia because development is inevitable. We're losing garden spaces. Why not have it on our roofs? So one of the things that we're pushing, especially for better design and more sustainability, is a different way of componentry and uh, typology in uh, Melbourne suburbia. We're also currently doing uh, installation for Chinese New Year in Westville, Doncaster on the 13th of January. And uh, yeah, we're also designing a line of furniture in collaboration with a furniture company. So we do have a bit of work going on, very varied, but also very exciting. Thank you again, Mond. It's been absolutely fantastic to talk to you. And on behalf of everyone who's participated in this event, I'd like to offer my sincere thanks for giving up your evening. Not a problem. Anytime. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you again soon.